It is hot. All of us in the Northern Hemisphere are getting roasted right now. On my ride, it's 37 degrees, which is 99 in freedom units, and I'm boiling. We need really strong hydration strategies to combat these conditions. In a previous video, uh, I introduced a drink mix, which is pretty decent, but it's not up to the task in these kind of conditions. I've also been reviewing the Saturday app, which is excellent for shorter rides, but has limitations for ultra distance events. Today, I'd like to guide you through the recipe for drink mix version 2.0, which promises to be more delicious, stay palatable for longer, provide better hydration, and better adapt to your fueling needs. Let's get into the science and then into the recipe. Research on this topic seems mainly divided into two camps. Let's call the first group Team Prescribed Drinking. They mainly produce research that supports measuring and replacing lost fluid and electrolytes, and often overlap with high carb fueling strategies and more intense activities. They tend to identify 2% loss of body mass from sweat as the threshold for decreased performance and body function. And generally, they support that a mix of water, sodium, and carbs allow overall greater consumption of each element than when isolated. The Saturday app would fall into this group. Next is Team Drink to Thirst, who produce research that supports drinking plain water as one feels fit, sometimes called ad libitum, and limiting sodium supplementation during events. Their findings overlap with research supporting fat-adapted fueling, and they tend to identify 3% or greater body mass loss from sweat as the threshold for when performance degradation begins. Uh, their research also focuses more on low-intensity activities and much more on the ultra-distant side of things. These two groups would find different results from the same batch of data, and their conflict with each other is poorly hidden even by the veil of academic language in their work. But we don't need to take part in their conflict. Instead, we can glean useful insights from both of their works. Neither group did a good job of expressing their recommendations for people with larger or smaller body sizes from the average athlete. So I'll try to improve upon that here in this video just by using a different way to express the same ideas. The 2 to 1 glucose to fructose ratio with a maximum of 90 grams per hour is the basis of my previous video, Sugar Is Your Friend. Uh, it's been repeated so many times and has offered such great improvement over the dead reckoning that a cyclist would give their own nutrition that it would be really easy to just continue along using that convention. However, science marches on and we've got better data now. Researchers have found repeated evidence that a higher fructose ratio than that increases total exogenous carb oxidation rate during exercise and the rate of replenishment of glycogen in the body after exercise while reducing tummy problems compared to something like a pure glucose solution like maltodextrin. Interestingly, they've also determined that plain sugar as a source for equal parts glucose and fructose has no impact on oxidation rates compared to freeform versions of glucose and fructose. These findings are particularly interesting to me because I love to save money and I hate to buy specialty products just out of convenience. It looks like the 1 to 1 ratio in sugar might even outperform a 2 to 1 ratio found in many commercial products. This could be refined to 1 to 0.8 ratio with some dextrose or maltodextrin, but it looks like 1 to 1 is really close to optimum anyway, so what's the point in adding some complexity when you can just pour the big bag from the kitchen into your bottle? Small bags of sugar are readily available at convenience stores and marts on the road, which makes for resupply on multi-day events extra easy. So it seems like just using plain table sugar as a carb source is a win-win-win. While the 90 grams of carbs per hour limit has been questioned for highly trained athletes in intense conditions, it's currently still seen as a fair general recommendation and should help us avoid tummy problems if enough water is consumed alongside the carbs. Stored glycogen, free fatty acids, body fat, and whole food will make up the inevitable energy deficit of burning 700 calories per hour for my endurance rides and up to 1,000 calories per hour on my tempo rides. Recent research has used grams per kilo of body weight over time to describe carbohydrate dosing and energy requirements, which I hope to see researchers use more moving forward. I doubt my wife could process the same amount of carbs as me since I'm double her weight. This nomenclature would help athletes better individualize their nutrition strategies too. I love easy math, so an average of one gram per kilogram per hour is a fine starting point and I can just adjust from there. Rides are rarely the exact plan length of time anyway, so there's no need to get too picky. 
Our sweat's composed of water and a range of electrolytes, and the amount of sweat that we lose is dependent on internal factors related to our body and external factors like the weather and the intensity of the exercise that we do. Of these sweat components, a deficiency in water, or dehydration, and reduced sodium concentration in our blood, exercise-associated hyponatremia, are the primary concerns for developing a replacement strategy for training and for during events. And a reasonably diverse whole food choice should replace the other components of our sweat, even during ultra-distant cycling events. So what do we do about dehydration and losing enough sodium to turn black bibs gray? Dehydration is well known to reduce blood volumes, which in turn increases heart rate, cardiac stress, and reduces various performance metrics and our body's resistance to heat strain, which is often also linked to lots of sweat. One analysis of research found an average heart rate increase of 3.3 beats per minute per percentage of body mass loss from sweat. To combat this, attempting to match estimated water loss with hydration would seem prudent. Building a database of nude, dry weigh-ins before and after exercise that mimic the environmental conditions and effort level of events that you target can help build an understanding of your typical sweat loss rates. This can act as an aid alongside thirst and just general intuition to achieve a more complete hydration than drinking to thirst alone, especially if activities are long, intense, or in hot conditions. As a 92 kilogram cyclist, my sweat rate greatly exceeds the recommendations and expectations of both camps of researchers. For me, one liter per hour is pretty normal. When it's hot out, it gets up to one and a half liters per hour. And if I'm exercising intensely in the heat, 1.8 up to two liters per hour is what I can expect to lose. At such high rates, the recommendations of like 500 to 700 milliliters of water per hour are just completely unacceptable. And in part, that's because uh, other research has found that body mass makes up about 50% of the predicted sweat rate that an athlete can expect. To account for body size, milliliters per kilogram per hour is probably a much more useful metric than raw liquid volumes. Sodium has to be considered when we're talking about endurance hydration replacement. Sodium has been known to increase thirst, to decrease urination, and that should result in an overall higher level of water retention over time and less likelihood for severe dehydration. For about 20 years, Team Drink to Thirst has been warning that overdrinking plain water dilutes sodium concentrations in the blood, resulting in limbs bloating up and hyponatremia. Their solution seems to be drinking low volumes of water in most conditions, thus keeping relative sodium concentrations high, but at the cost of a greater, but arguably acceptable loss in body mass. The International Society of Sports Nutrition gives a perspective on these issues that aligns more with team prescribed drinking, advising greater fluid consumption and 500 to 750 milligrams per liter of sodium supplementation for non-extreme conditions in single-stage ultramarathons. To weigh this advice and recommendations and the supporting evidence, it's really easy for me as a large cyclist who sweats a lot of salty sweat and lives in a hot country to choose the recommendation with more water consumption and the highest level of sodium supplementation recommended by the ISSN. Even the most perfect and well-balanced supplemental drink is useless if you don't want to drink it. External factors like event length, heat, the temperature of the drink, all work to reduce the palatability of a carb-sodium drink mix. So do the ingredients in the drinks themselves. Concentrated sugar and table salt wreck my taste buds within about 8 hours and sometimes faster. The deteriorating taste of drink mix could be influenced by chloride though, which makes up about 60% of the weight of table salt. Can we get sodium elsewhere? The answer to that is yes. Sodium citrate has become incredibly valuable to my drink mix, even though it's more expensive and harder to find than table salt. At only 26.7% sodium, more sodium citrate is needed versus table salt to reach the same sodium concentration. But the citric acid carrier of sodium citrate has no negative impact on taste like the chlorine in table salt. The result is a drink that can carry more sodium palatably, is more delicious generally, while being palatable for longer durations and in more harsh conditions. Multiple days worth of sodium citrate can be packed and added to sugar picked up along the way to make dry mix bottles for multi-day events. All right, so it's time to make our personalized drink mix. 
Uh, to do that, I've developed a calculator because there's too much individual variation and weight plays too much of a role to be able to give a blanket statement. This is a similar technique used with apps like Core or the Saturday app, but it's not included in the research. Our first input is body weight. Here we have the 70 kilogram average rider that's often used in academic research. Various other weights are included here, and the results that would be given for those weights are also included here just for visualization. But for us, we can input our weight here. This average rider also sweats an average amount, and the result is that they sweat 700 milliliters per hour. This matches with the upper end of the recommendations given by various groups. But if they're doing an ultra distance event, they're going to want to very closely match their water intake with their sweat rate. So here we can use those things interchangeably. This rider doesn't have completely white clothing every time they're out for more than a few hours, so we'll put in a moderate amount of sodium loss. They're riding rather intensely and they're not using too much whole food or many snacks to supplement their fueling. They're trying to fuel completely with carb mix. So for that, we'll put in 1.2 grams of carbs per kilogram per hour which results in a rate very near to the maximum recommendation given in the research. Using small pro looking bottle sizes, uh, this rider can expect to drink one bottle every 51 minutes. They'll fuel their two hour activity with about 2.3 bottles. And each bottle will need to include about 73 grams of dry mix. If they're doing a 200K brevet and they're wanting to prepare some dry mix, they'll wanna carry uh, close to 700 grams total. That would include 10 and a half grams of sodium citrate. We can use this to personalize for ourselves though. I have a 300K ride coming up soon, so let's plan for that. I'm 92 kilograms. I sweat more than the average rider. Because of that, I can expect to try to keep up by drinking 1.2 liters of water per hour. I'm a salty sweater and my clothes turn gray pretty quickly just from my salt. So I'm gonna go with near the maximum recommended amounts of sodium per liter of water. Because I love to stop at restaurants and enjoy some delicious food, I'm gonna actually lower my target carbs per kilogram per hour down to about 0.9. This is still more than the 70 kilogram rider, roughly the same as them, but because I'm bigger, it's relatively less. Big bottles only for me, and I'll need to pack them with just over 60 grams of dry mix. Notice my uh, ratios of sugar to sodium citrate are very different because of my sweat rate. I'll try to drink one of these bottles every 43 minutes or so, but I'm not gonna be too strict. These events are for enjoying, and I just need this as a guideline to make sure I don't fall too far behind. For a 300K, I'll try to plan for about 12 active hours that I'll need to fuel. Because of this, it recommends one kilogram of sugar, which is way too much for me to want to carry starting from the start line. For this though, I can make a plan. I can carry half of this amount of sugar and half of this amount of sodium citrate from the start, and carry the other 20 grams of sodium citrate separately and mix it with sugar on the road. Hopefully now you can use this calculator to better plan fueling for your ultra distance events. And really, if you wanted to, you could also use this for planning training rides. Play around with the numbers, see what works for you because as we've learned, everybody's different. Ride safe and see you all in the next video.